Mr. Wizard. Oh, hi, Heather. What have you been doing? Just playing ball at the park. What are you doing? Well, I'm just out watering the lawn. Yeah. Hey, that reminds me. Have you ever made a rainbow? No. Have you seen one, though? A lot. Yeah, what do they look like? Well, they've got lots of beautiful colors, and they're usually bright ones. Mm -hmm. Different different colors. And where do you see them? In the sky. Yes. Now, you know what makes a rainbow? Water and sun? Yes. What you have to do is have tiny, tiny droplets of water up in the air, and then have the sun behind you, and then everybody sees their own special rainbow. And when you're out sprinkling the lawn, maybe when your dad's out, you have him do this. Turn the sprinkler until it's as fine as you can get it. Okay. And then look into the little spray. You see the spray over there? You uh, see the rainbow? Yeah, over it's there? beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? So next time your dad's out sprinkling, you have him turn the hose real fine, and you can make a rainbow. Two eggs, Jason. One is fresh, the other is hard boiled. Okay. Quick little quiz for you. Which is which? I don't know. They both look, look the same. Yeah, they look exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, try spinning one in the middle of the dish right there. Okay. Okay, now spin the other one. Okay. That one's kind of hesitant to spin it. Mm. Now let's do the same thing, but this time with uh, a transparent egg. That bowl is an egg. Okay, like the spin bottom it. of an egg? Yeah, spin it. Okay. If, that bo if that were a, uh, the, either the fresh or the hard-boiled, which would you think that a plain bowl like that would be? Probably the hard-boiled because there's... It's All well. solid. Now put some water. Yeah. Fill, fill the, the uh, mm. dish about half full of water. All right. And over there sitting next to it is a cork. When you get it half full, put the cork in the water. Okay, good. Okay. Cork. Now this would be what? The fresh egg or the hard boiled? Probably the fresh egg because it has liquid in it. Right. Now spin that. Okay. It's that. Well, it's hesitant. Not to mention the cork doesn't. It stays in the same place. Okay. Now give it a good spin and watch what happens to the cork when you stop it. Put it over to the side like that. Now try. Oh, then the cork moves. Okay. Now spin the two eggs again. It's going quickly. And this one's kind of slowing down. So from your experiment over there, which do you think is which? I think this is probably the fresh egg. Because it's, it was hard to get started? Yeah. Now try another thing. Spin it, and this time take your hand off. Stop it and take your hand off of it. it just stopped. Okay, now try it with that one. Okay. It kept going. Yeah, do it again with that one. Don't quite so fast. Make sure that you really have stopped it. Okay. Yeah. It still keeps going. Okay. So you're going to break them open to prove uh, okay. which is which. Which do you decide is which? That's hard boiled and that's fresh. How are you going to prove it? Breaking them open. Okay, go right ahead. Yep. This one is the hard boiled one. Okay. Then the other one had better be the fresh one, right? Well, yeah. Okay, see if you were right. Ooh. You were Yuck. Right. Transparent knobs along the edge of woven fibers indicate this is something man-made. A clue. Another row of knobs is brought from above and pressed into this row. The knobs interlock to close a gap, usually in fabric. An unusual view of that ingenious device, the plastic zipper. Have you ever looked closely at a mothball, Lala? Not really. It smells too much. Yeah, they're pretty smelly. Well, that's because the material in the mothball evaporates into the air. And, but if you do take a close look at it, notice there's a little shine, mm -hmm. little sort of glisten. That means that they're made of crystals, and those are the little crystal surfaces that you're seeing. I use them, though, to illustrate a very important scientific technique, which is to make crystals. Have you ever tried to make crystals? Yeah, I went, but it didn't work. What were, what were they all? Well, I was trying to grow rock candy. Yes, and what happened? Well, Nothing just, happened? Nothing well, happened. Well, you were trying to grow uh, crystal from solution. You dissolved it in, yeah. in water. 
I, I'm going to grow crystals being mothballs, but I'm going to melt them and condense the vapor into a crystal. And here's how I did it. Took the mothballs, put them in the bottom of the dish like this, yeah. put it on the stove in a double boiler until the mothballs melted and actually boiled a little bit. Then I allowed the, this vapor to condense on the top here and cool. And you can see why I call this mothball frost. Take a look at it with a magnifying glass and you can see little tiny crystals. Oh, they're tiny. Yes. They're all in a pattern, too. Yes, all in a pattern. They're all very similar shaped. Yeah. And then, look what happened to the mothball solution when it cooled. It just went on the bottom and made a sort of glassy surface. Yes, but you see the crystals in there? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so this looks like what? Jack Frost on the window. With mothballs. Right. <laughs> Tennis, you know what random means? Well, sort of. It's, um, it could be numbers in any order, but not. it doesn't have to be in the correct order. It's just in any place. Any? Well, here, give me an example of it. Write okay. down the numbers from 0 to 9 in random okay. order. Okay, that's fine. That's enough. Okay. Because I already see that it's not random. Mm-hmm. Why isn't it's it not. random? You, I thought, told you to write down random numbers. Yeah. Why did you choose the seven here after the two? Because it wasn't a two? No, I just, it was just a number that I really? put down. Really? Okay. Yeah. And you've got one repeat, one and one here. Oh. Well, that, isn't that all right? Couldn't I don't it, know. Well, you see, the idea of randomness is very important in science. Because if you try to write down a list of numbers, I don't care who you are, you're always going to have some little technique for choosing the next one. Well, I haven't used that one in a little while, or I haven't used this one in a little while, or something. So scientists, when they want random numbers, they have... At one time, there was a whole book full of nothing but random numbers. Now, they use them in... For example, if you had an assembly line, and things were going along, and you wanted to test the items that are coming down, Mm -hmm. You don't want to test every tenth one or every hundredth one. You want to choose them randomly. Oh. So they would write a program for their computer that would pick the random number. Then also, if they were going to try to chart the path of a molecule or a radioactive particle, no one knows what direction it's going to go or how far it's going to go, so they would use a random number to determine its direction and its distance. Oh. So scientists use random numbers all the time, and almost every computer has built into it a generator that generates random numbers. One over here, I'll, sh I'll show you mine over here. Okay. Sit down at the computer. And I have the program all set up. You just type run, R-U-N, okay. and then enter. There they come. Thousand of them. Yeah. And you could write a program that had a million of them if you wanted, if you needed that many. Yeah, but yeah. that would take quite a long yes, time, Yes, it would take too. quite a long time. Right. But now... There's also a game based on random numbers. Mm -hmm. Would you like to play it? Yeah. Okay, type L-O-A-D, load, space, now quotation mark, G, mm -hmm. for, okay, and then quotation mark, and now enter. Now we're going to load the new program. Okay. Now type run. Whoops, it says I-O error. Okay, so... Type it again. L-O-A-D. Okay. okay space, quotation mark, G, and now quotation mark again, and now enter. Now I hear it buzzing away. Yeah, okay, now type is. run. Enter. Yeah. Now I've set this one up so that it's choosing arbitrarily a random number between 1 and 100. You have to guess what it is. It says, what is your guess? Okay. What are you going to guess? Um, I'll guess 50 because that's half of 100. Oh, wait, what, what's that got to do with it? Well, it could, it's part way between, so it could be um, high or low. Ah, you're using a technique that scientists use, too. And engineers and, and people that are, that are organizing a search party, for example, or when they're doing an archaeological dig. If you wanted to examine an area, you'd divide it in half, and you look in that area. If you don't find anything, you know it must be in the other half type of thing. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, and that's exactly what you're doing. Okay. okay. Try 50 and see what happens. Okay. Enter. So it's too high. It's too so now high. what are you going to try? Um, I'll try half of 50, so I'll put 25. Okay. Enter. Still too high. Um, well, there's not really a half of 25, so I'll just go with 12. Okay. 12. Still too high. Still too high. I'll Don't go you see how you're narrowing down the, your choices? Yeah, I'll go with six now. Six, then. All right. Too high yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll try half of that, yeah. then. Try three. three. Ah, That's took you five guesses. That was pretty good. Ordinarily, you'd do it in, a, in at least six. Try it again. This okay. time, see what the number it is. Are you okay. in? What's your guess? You're going to take 50 again. Yep. It's too, too low. low. Okay. I'll go with 75 now. Okay, you're going to divide the difference in half, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Too low again? Too low. Well, I'll say about 87 then. Okay. It's too high, so between 75 and 87 now. All right. Um, I'll try 78. Okay. Too, too low. low, so it's between 78 and 87. Um, 83, I think, this time. Too high. Too high. So it's between um, 83 too high and 78 too low. I'll try 81. Whoops. There. Still too high. Too high. 81 and 78. Um, 79, I think, maybe. That's the number. 79, yes. Seven guesses. Yes. Anyway, you can have a lot of fun sort of playing with this sort of game on your computer, but the important thing is that the computer has been designed to produce a whole series of random numbers because they're very useful in science. If you want to become a biologist who specializes in working with animals, here's the kind of project you might work on. You'd place nesting boxes in meadows to attract wild starlings. When the starlings move in, you'd capture some of them. You'd feed them carefully measured doses of chemicals used by farmers to control insects. Then you'd release the birds and observe them to see if the chemical interferes with their ability to gather insects and raise their young. You'd fit some of the nests with cameras to record the birds each time they return to their nests. The information collected could be helpful to you and other scientists in developing safer insecticides. You might expect to be doing all this out in the wilds, yet if you worked at this important center for wildlife research, you'd be surrounded by more than three million people. You see here at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Methods were developed for saving the California condor, the whooping crane, and the bald eagle. And it's about halfway between Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. Old-fashioned peanut brittle. Do you like peanut brittle? Yes, I do. Well, here, have some. Oh, I think I know what's inside. Not peanut brittle? No, snakes. The oldest trick in the book. Well, open it and see if you're right. Okay. <laughs> you were right. Yes. Now, this was a very serious scientific experiment. Did you realize that? <laughs> no. Would you get the snakes for me? I'll show you. It really was. Did you notice what the reaction was? Well, yeah. Even though I knew it was inside, I was still, I still was jumped a bit. Well, that's, that was one reaction, but the reaction I'm talking about is the reaction of the can. There was no reaction. I was holding the can. Well, there, even though you were, there was still a reaction. Because now we'll set it up again. This time, I will put the top on upside down and then okay. hold it in place with a rubber band. Like that. Now, Stacy, what will happen if you take the scissors and cut the rubber band? Well, when the snakes go flying, the lid will, too. Yes. But this time, Let's keep track of what's happening to the can. Here's a little truck. <clears throat> Let's set it down over here on the floor. Okay. I'll aim it about right there. Come around over here and get ready to cut the, the rubber band. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Do you know that old business? Remember I said, what's the reaction? And yes. you thought I was talking about yours? Yeah. Then I said the can? 
Do you, know, you remember the law? That oh, yeah, the one by Sir Isaac Newton. Yes, what did he say? He said to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, so that's the reaction I was talking about. What's the action going to be here? Well, the lid's going to fly off the stakes, and the can and the truck are going to be going that way. Right. So that's what's going to be with the action. I told you I was doing a serious scientific <laughs> experiment. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, go. Eugene, how much do you weigh? 69 pounds. How do you know? Because I've checked it on a scale. Yes. When you step on the scale, what are you really measuring? Do you know? Um, gravity? Yeah, the force of gravity pulling you down. Uh, have you ever seen uh, the astronauts when they're weightless? Yes, they float around in space. Yeah, they float around. Looks like... Have you ever been weightless? Mm, yes. When? When I jump sometimes. Like, like when? Show me. What do you mean? When are you weightless? Well, when I'm up in the air. Yeah, when you're off the ground. When, and all the while you're falling until you hit the ground. Because that's the only time you can eliminate the force of gravity is in a thing called free fall. And they actually did some experiments with the astronauts in airplanes in which they had them do a loop so they could be out, have, uh, get rid of gravity. And how about uh, skydivers? Yes, when they fall out of planes. Right, when they're in free fall, yes. they're weightless and they, they just like glide astronauts. Around. And they, well, we can actually make these clothespins to prove our point. See, here's two clothespins with a thick rubber band that ordinarily, if the rubber band were free without the weight of the clothespins, it would go like that, right? Now, if you hold the clothespin up like this, at the moment when you drop it, think of what's going to happen. Mm, maybe uh, as they free fall, the, the, they would be weightless, right. and the rubber band would snap them together. Okay, see if you're right. Try it again. Okay, now do it again. This time, well, imagine what it would like if you could see it in slow motion. Put it up. What would happen now? Well, pro the gravity that would be eliminated as they free fall on the rubber band would snap them together. Well, you're absolutely right, Eugene. Tennis, I assume you've been in an office at some time or other where they have a water cooler? Yeah, I saw one in my Aunt, in my aunt Diane's office one time. Did you, did you notice what happened? We'll describe what? it first of all. What is it? Look okay, like? there's a big glass jar that w filled with water, of course, and it's on top of a little stand. And at the bottom, there's um, a knob that you turn um, to get the water to mm -hmm. come out. And then what happens when the water comes out? There's these big bubbles that go up to the top. Mm -hmm. You didn't recognize my version of it here? No, I didn't. This is the typical that. version of the office water cooler because I wanted to make sure you understand how, I, how it works. This glass has a hole in it down there, and that's the spigot that you get the water out of. Now, notice there's another hole up here. Yeah. Okay, here is the big jar of water. I'm going to turn it upside down over the glass. You watch what happens. Okay. Okay, you want to put your finger over the spout okay. there now? Okay, now the water stopped coming out, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now take your finger off. Um, the bubbles just like at, just like the other coolers. Yeah. Okay, now stop it once. See if you can figure where are the bubbles coming from, and why doesn't when you hold your finger over this hole, why doesn't the water level come out and run out of that hole? Because the mouth of the jar is um, touching the level of the water, the top of the water. Yeah. And the water that's coming down there is just touching it there. Well, in other words, as soon as the water, let the water go out once. Watch the water level there, see it? Yeah. Oh, the water, each time a bubble goes up, more water comes down. Yes. Now put your finger on the hole again. As this water level drops, air can get in up here. Oh. Okay, when you put your finger over the hole, this water level rises and covers the mouth of the bottle so that no air can get in. That's what causes the bubbling. Oh, I was wondering about okay, that. Okay, and then why doesn't the water run up here and come out that hole? Because the mouth of the jar is, is touching the top of the it's water. It's underwater, so it can't come out. Anyway, so have a drink. This illustrates one theory of how some of the Earth's mountains were formed.
Once this was a smooth surface, but the material below shrank, just as the molten inner part of the earth did as it cooled. The outer skin buckled and folded, forming the mountains on the surface of a decaying apple. Hi, Mr. Wizard. Oh, hi, Lila. Why did you want me to bring my bike and meet you by the swing swings? Well, I wondered if you know how many wheels it has. Oh, that's easy. There's two wheels. That's why it's called a bicycle. As a matter of fact, there are six wheels on your bicycle. There are? Three different kinds. Oh. Here, let's take a look at them. This is one of the obvious ones, right? Yeah. A wheel. And notice, by the way, the axle doesn't go around, so it's just a plain wheel. And how about that one back there? This is a wheel. And, and axle. It, and it has an axle. And an axle. So those are the two main ones. Yeah. But look what happens when you go up here on the chain. Look at this. See this one? That's another wheel. The pedal. Yes. That goes round and round. And that's a plain wheel, not wheel and axle, right? Yeah. OK. Then what's it attached to? A wheel and, and an axle. axle. Right. So how many have we got so far? Four. One, two, three, four. Then you uh, can steer your bike, I assume. Yeah with a steering wheel. And that's a wheel and axle, right? Right. Okay, so there's five. Where's the sixth one? Well, come on over here. I want you to come over here by the swings so I can hang up this bicycle wheel on a rope from the swings. Now, watch what happens when I swing it like this. It rocks back See and forth. See how it rocks back and forth? But now I'll just give the bike wheel a little spin and watch what happens. It's like a spinning top or a gyroscope. Yes. It stays on a nice flat plane. Yeah. But that's, you don't ride your bicycle sideways like that. No. You ride it like this. OK, I'm going to give it a spin. But before I do, I want you to tell me now. Uh, oh, wait. First, I should explain that when you're riding along on your bicycle, your bike, bike wheels act something like a gyroscope in this plane. If I let go right now, what's going to happen? It's going to go flat. Yeah, it's going to go flop like that. But if I give it a spin, it's going to stay up. It stays up because of that gyroscopic effect. So that could be the front wheel of your bicycle, help holding you up. So yeah. what are the six wheels on your bicycle? The front wheel, the back wheel and axle, the pedal, the wheel and axle with the chain, and the steering wheel, and the, and the gyroscopic, gyroscopic wheel. Right. 